My talk uh, today is about socioeconomic differences, health and addiction during the corona pandemic. Um, I am a professor at uh, Ivo Research Institute and Maastricht University. Um, and my research focus is on socioeconomic differences, addictive behaviors, health and well-being, and people in vulnerable positions. So um, a few months ago, um, the COVID-19 pandemic started and I was immediately thinking, uh, what would be the impact of this pandemic on socioeconomic differences, addictive behaviors, people in vulnerable positions and health and well-being? Uh, of course, because this is my um, research focus, I was immediately thinking about um, what the impact would be of this pandemic. Um, today, uh, during the lecture, I will um, talk to you about things that I um, already could find about um, changes that we are already seeing. Um, but it, for me, it's a little bit a different lecture than normal, um, for one, because it's online, and um, second, because I'm also uh, telling you about fears and concerns that we have for certain populations, and not only evidence that we have, because it's um, yeah, still developing, and of course, we will know in 10 years what the exact impact on socioeconomic differences will be, um, and not already. In this lecture, I will start with an introduction to socioeconomic differences in health, um, because uh, most of people who participate right now um, are students, um, um, medicine students from Utrecht University, and some others are just um, interested uh, in the talk and uh, also um, join us. Um, so perhaps for the others as well, it's good to have a little bit of an introduction to socioeconomic differences in health before I start. Um, with the possible impact um, of the pandemic um, on these topics, on socioeconomic differences and also addiction. Um, I have um, divided this in three parts. Um, uh, first is the disease, then comes the measures, and finally the economy. And finally, I will um, end with some final remarks and also with time for questions, of course. First, um, I have some questions for you. Um, so um, if you could go to menti.com and use the code 135245, then you can answer just a few quick questions to know um, who's in the room and, uh, or in the room, <laughs> who's joining this, uh, this webinar um, uh, and what your thoughts are about this topic. You can also use the QR code, um, but then you have to be fast before I go to on the next slide. Um, so you can make a picture of the QR code to go to menti.com automatically, or you can type in on your phone or on your computer menti.com and use the code 135245. Um, I have a few quick questions for you. The first one uh, is from which country are you? And I see that you are already used to using uh, menti.com, so 30 of you have already filled in uh, the first question. Um, so I see a lot of people from the Netherlands and some have um, spelled it in uh, Dutch and some have uh, said de before Netherlands. Um, and we also have people from Russia, Belgium and Suriname. And I have 40 answers right now. So I am from the Netherlands myself. Um, most of the talk, um, I will try also to include more a world view of what is happening and not only focus on the Netherlands, uh, but of course, um, I know most about um, where I'm from. Um, so it'll focus a bit on uh, the Western world, I guess. And the Caribbean. Uh, most of you are from the Netherlands. North Korea, okay. Well, it's very good to have uh, such a diverse uh, company here. <laughs> Already 50 answers. Um, I think about 70 of you are here, so I'll wait for a few minutes. Okay. I'm not sure whether... Um, I think everyone, you. yeah, maybe I'll go further. I don't know if everyone uses Mentimeter or is just watching. <laughs> um, and if you're joining later with Mentimeter, you can also uh, join in with the second question. That's no problem. OK. 
couple more. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, the second question um, is whether you are a student, um, perhaps a researcher, because um, colleagues of mine or people from my LinkedIn uh, might have joined, uh, other professional or just someone who's interested. And I see that most of you are the students, uh, probably from uh, Utrecht University because it's part of your course. And we are almost to 60. Yes. Okay. And then finally, um, uh, the last question for now. Um, do you agree or disagree with the question or the statements, the consequences of Corona are the same for everyone, rich or poor? And a lot of you disagree with this. Well, quite clear <laughs> that you already know uh, something about this topic. Maybe um, uh, others um, of this lecture series have already told you a little bit about this, um, or you're just assuming um, this because of um, uh, because of the topic of my talk. Okay, I agree with you that um, I also disagree to this statement, but I will explain why um, during this talk. Um, so first, let me introduce um, socioeconomic differences in health. Socioeconomic position is the social standing or social class of an individual or a group. And um, it is often measured as a combination of education, income or occupation. And someone with a lower socioeconomic position, so that someone, uh, for example, with a lower education or a lower income, um, uh, they may have um, less well health. Uh, so lower socioeconomic position is associated with higher levels of obesity, higher rates of tobacco use, um, higher rates of chronic diseases, depression, social problems, chronic stress, um, and many more things. And this results in less healthy life years and um, also in shorter lives of people with a lower socioeconomic position. There are socioeconomic differences between countries. Um, and you can see here, for example, the average life expectancy at birth um, in high income countries, it is higher than in low income countries. So in high income countries, the average life expectancy at birth is 81 years, um, while it is uh, 63 years in low income countries. So that's quite um, a large difference. But there are also socioeconomic differences within countries. And I'm now showing you an example um, of the Netherlands. Um, but the pattern um, is the same in other countries. Um, people with a high educational level have an, a higher average life expectancy at birth than people with a lower educational level. And also people with a higher educational level have a higher life expectancy without physical limitations than people with lower education. And you can see even more differences um, in this green bar about life expectancy without physical limitations. Um, an explanation for this is the social determinants of health. Um, so health is determined uh, not only by whether you go to a doctor or whether you choose to live healthily. Um, health is determined by a combination of personal characteristics and circumstances in which people are born, uh, grow up, uh, live and work. So for example, the economic stability of uh, not only the country, but also the household. Um, so um, whether you have a job and how much money you get, whether you get social welfare, um, the social and community context where you live is also a large influence on your health, um, the neighborhood and the environment, so the, the environment around you um, is influencing your health, um, then uh, the quality and availability of healthcare, and finally also education. So these are things that determine health and they are also very much related to socioeconomic differences. Um, a recent theory um, explains what scarcity um, or having too little uh, does to your brain. Uh, it's a recent uh, theory from 2013 uh, by an econ economist and a psychologist. And they explain that if you have scarcity, so for example, a lack of money or debts, um, then that uses all your mental energy and it creates um, a kind of tunnel vision 
uh, where you only focus on meeting uh, your unmet needs and not focus on other important decisions. This depletes your self-control and um, it makes sure that you are going to uh, myopic decision making, which is a very difficult word, uh, for short-term thinking. Um, so the fact that you're so um, uh, obsessed with um, having scarcity of money, uh, make sure that you uh, cannot make um, uh, very good decisions about health behaviors, for example. Um, unfortunately, health behaviors and poverty or having too little money um, are not something that happens in only one generation. There are intergenerational patterns and uh, this model shows um, the health poverty trap, which is one of the explanations. Um, and it says if you're ill and poor, um, then you have a choice. You can seek health care or you could not seek health care. Um, if you seek health care, this costs money. Um, but if you do not seek health care, then you remain ill and that also costs money in the end because you cannot work. Um, so this will mean either way that you have less income um, and then you can um, buy less healthy food and you cannot invest in education. So this ensures that your children also um, remain poor and then have a higher probability of illness. Um, that's why they will all, all also uh, can also be ill and poor. So then this keeps happening. Um, uh, so that, that's an explanation of intergenerational patterns um, in poverty and health. Um, to give a somewhat more concrete um, example of socioeconomic differences, I'm showing you um, something about tobacco use. Um, people with a lower socioeconomic position have a larger chance of smoking tobacco. Um, and this has a lot of um, different causes and you can see them uh, It's a very busy model with a lot of influences. Um, but the lower socioeconomic position um, ensures that people um, uh, live in a social environment where a lot of people smoke. Um, so they are under the social influence of others that they see smoking and they think it's normal to start smoking. Um, so they start smoking early, for example, uh, which makes them more addicted and less likely um, uh, to stop smoking. Also because of their lower socioeconomic position, um, they have less money, uh, which ensures that they cannot um, buy smoking cessation treatment and therefore they are less successful in smoking, a uh, smoking cessation. Um, and their lower socioeconomic position also um, causes them to have stressors in their lives. Uh, like I said um, uh, while back about uh, scarcity. Um, because of these stressors and also because of the social environment um, where a lot of people smoke, they have lower self-efficacy to quit smoking and also lower self-control to quit smoking. Um, uh, so you can see that, that especially the social environment that smokes is a, a large influence here. Um, and therefore, the difference between um, people with a higher and lower socioeconomic position um, in smoking um, remains uh, from generation to generation. So that was the, the short um, uh, introduction about uh, socioeconomic differences in health. And now I will talk, be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I've divided it into uh, three parts, the disease, the measures, and the economy. But of course, it's um, not that strict that you can really say, well, this is part of the disease and this is part of the measures, but I've tried to um, make a distinction. First, I'm showing you um, a short uh, movie clip. They tell us coronavirus is a great leveler. It's not. It's much, much harder if you're poor. How do we stop it making social inequality even greater? Hello, good evening. The language around COVID-19 has sometimes felt trite and misleading. You do not survive the illness through fortitude and strength of character, whatever the Prime Minister's colleagues will tell us. 
and the disease is not a great leveller, the consequences of which everyone, rich or poor, suffers the same. This is a myth which needs debunking. Those serving on the front line right now, bus drivers and shelf stackers, nurses, care home workers, hospital staff and shopkeepers, are disproportionately the lower paid members of our workforce. They are more likely to catch the disease because they are more exposed. Those who live in tower blocks and small flats will find the lockdown tougher. Those in manual jobs will be unable to work from home. This is a health issue with huge ramifications for social welfare and it's a welfare issue with huge ramifications for public health. Tonight, as France goes into recession and the World Trade Organization warns the pandemic could provoke the deepest economic downturn of our lifetimes, we ask what kind of social settlement might need to be put in place to stop the inequality becoming even more stark. One of the hardest things about dealing in... Okay, I think this sums up um, very nicely what my talk is about. Um, so I wanted to show you this. Graphs and numbers to... And now I want to do um, uh, one more um, question for you uh, about um, the possible impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on socioeconomic differences in health and on addiction and substance use. Um, this is just um, a brainstorm before I'm uh, telling you things um, about these possible impacts. A um, bit to trigger your mind of what could be possible impacts so you can you can type in um, short statements of what you think um, is happening and you can choose to uh, fill in all three boxes or just uh, one of them. Um, uh, I've also sent the students who are joining us from uh, Utrecht University some literature um, on, on alcohol use. Um, so maybe this triggers your mind about what could be the impact on substance use. Um, so I already see some things coming up. Uh, poverty, violence, um, higher rates of depression, an increase, I think this is about the socioeconomic differences, collateral damage, widening gap, black, white, increased dependence, and now a lot of answers are coming up, more substance use, depression, fear, income, money problems, so you're doing a very good brainstorm right now. Very nice, um, because you're all typing in different words now, the uh, words are getting very small. Uh, discrimination, suicide, money problems, um, depression and poverty, most often mentioned. Okay, thank you for um, this first brainstorm. Um, more depression, homelessness. Larger gap, discrimination. Yes, very good. Okay, well, let me um, go on with my talk. Um, I will start with uh, the possible impact of COVID-19 on the disease. Um, even before um, this pandemic, um, there were inequalities in vulnerability to infectious disease. Um, this report from 2013 said that there are groups who are subject to multiple social determinants of health um, that may be particularly vulnerable to infectious disease. And those are the poor and more disadvantaged individuals. Uh, they tend to suffer from a higher disease burden and are more likely to experience illness and disability. Um, and of course, this also um, is the case for this pandemic. Um, what we should keep in mind uh, when, um, uh, if and when we find a vaccine for COVID-19 um, is that some population groups have had poor access to vaccination in the past and also um, to healthcare systems. Um, so if there is treatment or um, a vaccine, then we should be careful that some population groups um, don't have access. Um, and also that um, uh, alcohol addiction and illicit drug use are strongly associated with poor treatment adherence. Um, so we should help um, this group even more. Um, hand washing is something that is, um, of course, very important. The single most effective way to prevent the spread of infections. Um, I hope you know that um, already. Um, and 60% of the world population has access to hand washing facilities at their home, um, just water and soap. Um, but this is much lower in the least developed countries. 
So um, 25% um, of Sub-Saharan Africa um, has um, basic um, uh, hand washing facilities at their home and nearly three quarters does not, um, which leaves this group even more vulnerable than um, they already were. Certain jobs, uh, people with certain jobs are more at risk. Um, it was already told in uh, the BBC Nightlife uh, clip that I showed. Um, some people were working in the front line, um, like nurses, supermarket employees and bus drivers. Um, they are more exposed to the virus because of their work. Um, and also they have lower paid jobs. An important um, determinant um, uh, of disease risk is getting paid sick leave. Uh, in the US, nearly half of all workers do not receive paid sick leave. Uh, this is very different to the Netherlands, uh, luckily. Um, but among the working population with the lowest income in the US, more than three quarters uh, receive no paid sick leave. So if you do not get paid uh, when you're sick, you could make the choice to go to work anyway. And then you could spread the disease even further um, among your co-workers who probably are also people with a lower income. And then the spread of the disease is more um, among this group. Research also shows that um, guaranteed paid sick, uh, sick days uh, would significantly improve public health and reduce the spread um, of viruses, for example, um, to the public, uh, for example, in restaurants and nursing homes. Um, and not only in uh, getting the disease, there are differences, but also in the severity of the disease. People uh, with obesity and people who smoke experience more severe um, COVID-19 disease and more often need to be hospitalized. Um, and in a lot of countries, including the Netherlands, there are large socioeconomic differences in obesity and smoking, which is more common among people with a low socioeconomic position. So this disease um, makes the difference that is already there even bigger. Also uh, chronic health conditions, which are um, also in part um, due to obesity and smoking, uh, but also due to other um, uh, determinants are more prevalent among people with a lower socioeconomic position. And these health conditions um, make the coronavirus more severe. So then you get socioeconomic differences in death rates um, but also among the survivors who've had um, severe COVID-19 disease and uh, were hospitalized. Um, we don't know um, the exact health impact of having had severe COVID-19 disease yet, um, but first results show that people um, remain having issues with their lungs, for example. So they may um, get a chronic health condition um, and socioeconomic differences um, will even increase further. Then there are also ethnic differences in COVID-19 cases. And some one of you um, already mentioned this in the, the brainstorm that we did. Um, in Chicago, for example, 72% of people who died of COVID-19 were black, um, but only one third of the population um, is black. So that's a large um, difference. And then in Georgia, um, white people uh, accounted for 40% of the cases. Um, but they represent 58% um, of the state. So this is an underrepresentation of um, people, um, uh, of white people. And then um, finally, some numbers from the UK. 35% um, uh, were non-white, um, which is much higher than the population uh, of non-white people in, in um, UK, which is 14%. Um, so where does this difference come from? It's not um, biological differences probably between people with uh, different backgrounds, um, uh, but income inequalities, for example, job insecurity, deprivation, and even the air quality of the living environments um, of people uh, with different ethnic back backgrounds. And you can see in the table that people um, or that um, uh, the patients with confirmed COVID-19 um, are mostly from the most deprived um, uh, populations. So that was the disease and now um, the measures. Um, so the lockdowns and the physical distancing.
staying at home um, is much more tougher if you live in overcrowded housing. Um, this is something that is not um, happening a lot or, or there are not a lot of socioeconomic differences in overcrowding of houses in the Netherlands, uh, but it is happening a lot in other countries. Um, so people who live in smaller houses with more people, um, they have more difficulty, of course, if they have to stay at home. Um, um, yeah, and they cannot go outside. Also, working from home uh, is not possible for everyone. Um, I am a researcher, so I can easily work from home. It's not really a problem. Um, but if you're doing manual work or um, working in healthcare, then you cannot work from home. And this table shows that people from the top 25% of incomes, um, 60 per, 61, 62%, sorry, uh, of them can work from home um, and from the bottom 25% of incomes, only 9% can work from home. Um, because of the physical distancing and the lockdowns, um, loneliness uh, increases um, and this can increase um, psychological problems, uh, which is even worse for people who already had existing psychological problems. Uh, which is something that is also um, socioeconomically related. Um, and in some places, um, I don't know whether that's everywhere in the world, but I think in a lot of places, facilities uh, like daycare activities, food banks and home care um, have closed or temporarily closed. Um, and that affects people with a lower socioeconomic position even more. Um, people with low literacy, I don't know what you've learned um, in your um, education already, so I will explain. Um, people with low literacy are people who need more time to read and listen to information um, before they can comprehend it. And um, this is also related to their socioeconomic position. Um, people with low literacy are more likely to be lower educated and have lower incomes and also are more likely to uh, be poor, for example. The COVID-19 pandemic is very dif difficult for this group. Um, there is a general information overload, um, even for, uh, for us. Um, a lot of people experience that there is a lot of information, um, but this is even more difficult if you have difficulty reading um, and listening to this information um, and comprehending it. There are constant changes in rules and policies, so you have to keep up with the information and to know whether you can go outside, whether you go in, can go in shops and things like that. Um, and there are a lot of difficult words used more than normally because we now have COVID-19, pandemic, immunity, um, and a lot of other difficult words. Um, there are a lot of um, written signs in shops, much more uh, and in other places and institutions. Um, in the Netherlands, there are no general rules about shops. They can stay open if they want, but they have to make sure that people are not too close to each other. Um, so on each shop, you will see a piece of paper saying, well, in this shop, you can be with maximum five people and in this shop, with maximum six people. So you will have to read that and see what other things they are saying about how you should behave in this shop, uh, which is very difficult if you have difficulty understanding the signs. Um, and also because of the physical distancing and the lockdowns, people will get reduced help, help uh, from informal caregivers, for example, with filling out forms. Um, it's also a difficult situation, of course, for people with mental health problems um, and people in addiction treatment. Many mental health and addiction services are staying open in the Netherlands and also in other countries um, or offer their services online. Uh, but of course, they struggle with um, physical distancing and staff sickness. For residents, um, uh, residential clients, it can be very difficult that they uh, can receive no or less visitors. And some, sometimes they have to stay inside. Uh, this can of course lead to uh, increased mental health problems for these clients. Um, and so also sometimes aggression against the staff. There is a large amount of care avoidance uh, for care in general, but also um, for mental health and addiction care at this moment. Um, I don't know about other countries, countries, but I know in the Netherlands that some places do not have a waiting list anymore. Um, 
not because people don't have problems anymore, um, but just they're just waiting for the situation to change and they're afraid to get infected if they go to an institution. So this is a problem, of course, for the people themselves who need this treatment. Um, but there are also large worries about the children of these people who do not get, get help. Um, those children are already in a very difficult position um, because they uh, well, living with, with someone, a parent, um, with uh, mental health problems or addiction can be very difficult. Um, and even more so if this person needs help but doesn't get help. Um, changes in alcohol and drug use um, are very dependent on um, the different population subgroups. Some people um, use less uh, alcohol and drugs uh, right now, um, and these are mainly the people who are not very dependent, um, and they use alcohol and drugs right now um, less uh, because there is less availability. You cannot go to a bar, for example, or a restaurant. Um, there are less parties, um, and also people are motivated to live healthily um, uh, because they don't want to get sick. But there's also an increase in use among people with high stress, um, anxiety, depression, loneliness, and even boredom, um, who use alcohol or drugs to cope with these negative emotions. And you can imagine that there are certain groups that are uh, more at risk for this, um, like uh, people who work in healthcare and are very, um, have very stressful lives at this moment, uh, but also people who are already poor or um, losing their jobs, um, people who have to juggle um, uh, working, um, working and also caring for their children. Um, uh, so there are a lot of groups who are more at risk. An example of the SARS virus outbreak in 2003 um, then alcohol use and alcohol dependence increased among healthcare workers who experienced a lot of stress. Uh, so who were working on the, COVID of, on the, on the wards um, for the SARS virus outbreak. In a lot of countries, the supply of alcohol or drugs is reduced. Um, sometimes there are measures that say you cannot um, buy alcohol, for example, or buy it um, less than normal. Um, and also the drugs routes um, uh, are more difficult because of lockdowns in certain countries. Um, and there are concerns about people um, who will get um, serious withdrawal symptoms um, or who then choose to use uh, more risky drugs or more risky ways of using drugs um, because they cannot get um, the normal drug of choice. And the third um, possible impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, on um, socioeconomic differences and addiction is the economy. And there is a large drop in employment. Um, in the first quarter of 2020, we mainly saw this in Asia, of course, uh, where the pandemic started. And in the second quarter, um, uh, these are projections, uh, we probably will see um, uh, also a drop, but then um, over the entire world. There is also a drop in the gross domestic product. These are EU numbers. Um, you see here uh, a timeline from 2008 to 2020 first quarter, and you see um, a large drop, a uh, very large and sudden drop in GDP growth rates uh, in 2020. And you can see that it is more sudden and more severe than um, the economic recession in 2008. Um, so uh, we cannot speak of an economic recession yet because you then have to have two consecutive quarters of uh, negative GDP growth rates. Um, but um, yeah, it's already quite clear that we will um, go into an economic recession um, in the second quarter of this year. And this has a disproportionate impact on certain subgroups. Um, we think that um, groups that are particularly vulnerable uh, are people with underlying health conditions and older people, um, also young persons, because they are just starting on the labor market um, and maybe cannot find um, a job or cannot find um, good social care uh, in their job. 
uh, women um, who are more in occupations at the front line, uh, for example, nursing, uh, self-employed and casual workers um, who have less social protection and migrant workers. There's also um, a predicted rise in global poverty. Um, this graph shows a projection of the impact of COVID-19 on global poverty. And what the researchers did, they um, compared um, uh, projections uh, or they compared the numbers from April to 2020 to uh, October 2029. Um, and they assumed that the changes between these months uh, were caused by the corona pandemic and then made a forecast um, for 2020 and 2021. And these forecasts show um, an increase in global poverty, and this would be the first increase since 1998. And if you um, uh, calculate it in numbers, then the COVID-19 pandemic uh, would push 49 million people into extreme poverty in 2020. There's also um, uh, a figure about regional differences in this rise in poverty. So you see the 49 million people here. Um, and 23 million people uh, from this are from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so um, uh, this depends on how many people are living close to the poverty line. Um, people from low and middle income countries um, uh, are often living more uh, close to the poverty line and uh, therefore they will suffer the greatest consequences um, in terms of extreme poverty. Um, and Sub-Saharan Africa is not the place where the virus had hit, has been hitting the most, um, uh, at least until now, um, but the projections uh, show that it will be the region hit hardest in terms of increased extreme poverty. So um, what is the impact of economic recessions on um, use of substances? Um, a few years ago, I've done a literature review um, for um, uh, the European Commission um, of literature from all over the world. And uh, it's quite a complicated uh, graph, but I'll um, help you through it. Um, there are a few mechanisms um, that could explain the impact of economic recessions um, on substance use. And we were uh, particularly interested in these mechanisms. So the first mechanism is uh, the income reduction mechanism. An economic recession, um, of course, um, uh, leads to uh, less income among certain people. And you can imagine if you have less money, uh, then you won't have money to buy um, tobacco or alcohol, for example. Um, so this could decrease your use. And this is called a pro-cyclical mechanism, and it's shown in green. Um, we do not see this for illegal drug use, probably because people, if they have less money, just um, turn to cheaper products, for example, um, um, or maybe um, uh, less illegal ways of um, obtaining income. Um, but we do see that an income reduction leads to less tobacco use and less alcohol use. And then the second mechanism, and this is the most important one because most literature has been found about this and most um, literature that shows um, uh, that this is an important mechanism um, is the psychological distress mechanism. So if you um, remember one thing of this slide and you should remember this mechanism. Um, an economic recession and also unemployment um, leads to more psychological distress among people. And um, if people have more stress, then they tend to use um, uh, more illegal drugs, more tobacco and more alcohol. Um, so, um, because this was the most important mechanism, uh, you often see an increase in these substances uh, during an economic recession. Um, other uh, mechanisms are that people have more time for substance use, which, which could um, increase illegal drug use. And they would have more time for treatment, so this could decrease tobacco use, but not much research um, has been done on this mechanism, so we don't know for sure. And also people who are unemployed may feel socially excluded. And this could um, increase their drug use and also their alcohol use. 
Um, so these are um, uh, things that could happen during an economic recession and have happened um, in the past. And because we expect an economic recession um, after um, uh, or during this uh, crisis, uh, we will probably um, see these things happening and probably we'll mainly see an increase um, uh, in use of these substances due to the psychological distress mechanism, although we could see a little bit less um, tobacco or alcohol use um, because people have less money. Some um, final remarks um, that I want to close with. I've shown um, a lot of negative things um, during this uh, lecture um, and a lot of worries and fears and concerns. So I want to um, end a bit more positive. Um, so some positive notes are that many governments are working on uh, income support policies and policies that are meant to prevent a rise in unemployment. Uh, so this is of course a good thing. Uh, mental health and addiction services are also working very hard to improve their services um, despite the circumstances and they are continuously learning on how to um, still uh, maintain their services despite uh, what's happening. And um, one thing that I see and um, um, I don't know whether others um, also notice it because I'm a bit more focused on this topic of course is that there is a lot of attention uh, right now for the possible increase in socioeconomic differences because of this pandemic. And I think this at attention um, uh, could ensure that there is um, also more policy attention for this group and that action uh, will be taken. And I want to um, also give um, a research recommendation. Um, if we want to know the true socioeconomic impact um, of the COVID-19 pandemic, then we need inclusive research. So we need to make sure um, that people with a low income, with low educational level from all different levels of the population are included in research. Um, and I see a lot of um, uh, things on my LinkedIn and on other places um, with a call to action, like uh, join in this research, uh, fill in this questionnaire, which is nice that people are doing research. Um, but if you do it like that and you don't know whether you're including everyone in your research, um, then you won't know what the impact will be uh, on the most vulnerable people um, of the population. Um, so now we have time for questions. Um, and um, I also want to thank my colleague Thomas Martinelli uh, for his help with preparing this lecture.